Gavin, great to see you. Looking so young as ever, mate. Looking young as ever. Yeah, behave yourself. <laughs> um, listen, usually we talk firstly about somebody's football career and then go on to their personal life. With you, we're going to turn that back to front because you had an extraordinary time over the last year. Um, you work in a hospital, for starters, and you've had the coronavirus, um, which can't have been nice. I explain in your own words what that's like. Um, it, it, obviously, it came as a very much a surprise. I, it was only been about a week or 10 days before this corona thing had uh, arrived. And um, so we didn't know really anything about it at all. No, nothing like the information that we have now. And the new kid on the block, well, obviously with no immunity to anything in the hospital, was about to get it. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I did pick it up. Um, and, yeah, it's the one positive thing I had was on my, my oxygen saturation levels, I was 1% OK to not have to be uh, taken into hospital. Um, so I was able to deal with it at home. Um, but it's, it, you know, as, as people will tell you, um, you know, there are different levels of um, symptoms that you get. Um, I can only obviously go based on, on what I felt, but it, it was awful. It was, you know, you certainly can understand if you've had it and had it bad. Um, why, if I was uh, even older than I am, or had anything underlying why, you know, you, you can unfortunately die from it. Listen, we see it on the news every night, and that's bad enough. You see it every day in the flesh. Does it make you angry when people still doubt its existence? I think you, I think you, you go beyond anger when, you, when you're dealing and, and trying to handle it and yourself on a daily basis. Um, it's just shock really i think if people could spend an hour or two hours with us um going around with us i think no one could ever say that you know this is you know it's not real you know they, they would be shocked at, at um how it affects people and how quickly it affects people of course mental health is the buzzword in these times but of course mental health mental health has existed since the year dot and you've been very open about your battles with depression. Um, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I just, I, th I, I think mine basically, I think the cause or one of the reasons for the way I struggled um, over the last couple of years um, was from not blaming it on, on a career in football, but my, my life has always revolved around um, my how I would judge myself on success in life. It would be up here. And, you know, when you come out of the game, anything is going to be lower than that. Um, so I used to be my biggest critic. You know, I'd feel that like I was failing because I wasn't reaching these standards. I would think that other people were, were thinking that I was failing. Whatever I did, even though I was being successful, whatever route I chose, it didn't seem enough to me. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, what I used to do. And I think a lot of people and certainly a lot of sportsmen do. I used to hide it. Um, but the only way I could get away from those negative thoughts was if I went on the booze, um, you know, for the evening that you're doing that, you're not thinking about negative thoughts. But obviously that tends to lead into even more issues or can do. Um, yeah, so it's. The, the realization came, and family split ups, and the realizing realization came that you know I've got to do something about this now, and, and try and live with it, and and cope with it, and understand it. So you had it, you had it when you were playing football as well. Um, I, I I I would have thought so, but because you are in this amazing world and and lifestyle, um. You, you can you you don't notice you've you've got it or you maybe have a tendency it's just when you you come out of it and but I suppose because you you know part of mine was I came out at 26 and obviously felt um, that wasn't fair um, you know through injury and 
you know, you can't do anything about it, but you just feel you're hard done by. And it's, you know, you think, oh, what could have been? And, you know, and it's just, you know, it all builds up. How do you actually cope with it? Well, now, mm. um, I think the, the key is, is really, I mean, and, and that's the other thing. I think part of my role as, as a player, it used to be I had to try and look after the players around me. Um, and I still do that, you know, obviously with the job I do, I think. But unless you, you look after yourself first and, and put yourself first and make yourself healthy, you can't help anyone else. So I think that for me, that's the key. And, and to not believe the negative thoughts that come in my head, really look at them. And, and when, when you can actually come up with scenarios where whatever it may be, oh, I'm a bad person or I'm failing, you, you know, you can come up with numerous situations. You know, John, do you think I'm failing? Ollie, do you think I'm failing? No, you don't those sort of negative feelings just disappear and, and you don't have to keep believing them. Yeah. So you, you'd say you've got it, you've got it controlled at the moment because it never really leaves you, does it? It's always there. Absolutely. Yeah. As, as Churchill said, you know, the black dog, he used to call it. It's always there. It's ready to, when you, when you least expect it, it's always waiting to uh, nip you on the ass um, yeah, and you just got to be aware of it. I mean, it's it's really tough now. You know, spending a lot of time um, at home alone. Um, my partner's in a, you know, has got a, a bit of a compromised um, situation, and she can't be. She's had a, her um, injection a couple of days ago, so we we've had to be apart. I and mean, apart from the kids, my older kids now. Um, because obviously it's safer to not travel and, and put other people under, you know, chance of getting it. So it's you spend four days, you do four days on, four days off. So four days totally alone, it, it drives you insane and it gives you too much time to think. You can't wait to get to work. And then through those four days, by the fourth day, because you're so worn out and worn down by the way it's affecting everyone, um, you know, you can't wait to get away from the hospital, um, but then you're getting away to come back to four days of, you know, solitary confinement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about your football career then. Um, tenacious, tough tackling, that, that's how I remember you as. <laughs> do I thank you for that, John? Or? <laughs> well, no, that's, that's, that's how I remember, and I'm sure many others do. Yeah, yeah, I think I... Think I I wasn't shy to um, tackle someone. Um, yeah, I think you've uh, most probably hit the nail on the head, as they say. Because when you came to Pompey, it was almost an extension of QPR, wasn't it? Because the owner was Jim Gregory, the manager was John Gregory. You had Warren Neal playing for Pompey. And so you left QPR and you came to an extension of it. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, the, the chairman made it clear that he, he really, really wanted me. Um, at the side, um, Bawley was the... Grego wasn't the manager then, it was Bawley. So Bawley obviously sold the club to me. Um, and but then was that? Yeah, I know, yeah, which was, uh, yeah, you know, you can't do much about that. Uh, and then, like you say, but it was nice to come into a dressing room where... You know, there were so many familiar faces. It, it, it did. It made you fit in straight away. Didn't really hit off for the team in your years here, did it? No. Um, I think maybe it was more... I think it was a cultural thing more. I think, you know, we, we maybe there was a few um, players that... Maybe the level was a little bit comfortable, and we weren't. A, we didn't always need to concentrate our lifestyles um, like like you should do, really. Um, you know, and that's an honest appraisal, myself included. I think you, you know, now you you, you literally cannot. Uh, you know, your diet has to be good. Your you know your social life has to be good. Whereas back then, no excuse. Uh -huh choices we made um yeah but i think we didn't achieve what we should have achieved really with the ability that we had you obviously loved it at pompey because you played 100 odd games which was more than anywhere else in your career so what were the things that you enjoyed at pompey um 
the main, not the main thing, but one of the biggest things was the, the crowd, the, the passion of the crowd, um, you know, is, you know, you'd go, have to go a long, long way to, to equal that. You know, I don't think you'd ever beat it, but to equal it, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's such a, a passionate place and a passionate town, uh, city, not town, um, amazing it's just you know to put on that you, you know any player who gets the the opportunity to to represent the club i'd say jump at it jump at the chance and you were near to home in london weren't you and it, it, portsmouth is almost london yeah i mean it wasn't I, I can't say it was when we we were playing to be honest i don't think it was anywhere near as as zhuzhi as it is now um it's it was a little bit you know a bit basic to be honest but you know, it's the club and supporters have made up for it, you know, more than anything. I mean, incredible, incredible atmosphere. Did you feel you were a bit hot-headed, you had a bit of a disciplinary problem, or were you, were you OK with that? <laughs> I think, again, I think it's... I think it's timing and that. I think you, you know, the, from coming there, I think referees were looking for me because of the Daddy Thomas incident which was made hugely public. Um, I think I was in a team where I felt some individuals weren't prepared to put their uh, 100% effort in. Um, so you felt like at times you were having to do some some other players' work as well or, or lay your body on the line. Um yeah, I just think it was, you know, one of those things. And, and like anything, once you once you get tired with that brush, it's very difficult to, you know, you, you know, you go with a with a you arrive with a, a nickname like Psycho. Um, you know, if that's going to sway any decision a referee has to make when they hear, you know, twenty two thousand people shouting it. Um, so it's it, but it's you know it. You know, as as it goes against you, and other on other ways, it goes for you. You refer to the Danny Thomas incident. Just explain that because it would have been covered these days by about cam cameras from every angle, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. It was you know it was uh, a, a terrible situation to be in, but obviously for him and and myself. Um, you know, there was no intent at all. I injured I injured him. Um, you know the way the the when you you can see the footage. The way it was, um, way it fell was he, he couldn't see me arriving. Um, if he had it done, he could have uh, rode the tackle a little bit better than he did. Um, yeah, and it was just you know devastating uh, for for him and and for me and my my family. Um, you know, and it's something you know that went on and on for about two years, and I think it was certainly part of the reason why. You know, Queen's Park Rangers uh, wanted to settle the case out of court. And I think that was part of the deal that I, that I moved. So, you know, there was ripple effects, you know, for ages. I kept going on and on and on. Did you ever speak with him after that? Yeah, when I saw him um, two days later in hospital, you know, was cried my eyes out in front of him. You know, I was only a young lad and uh, basically he said, you know, I know you didn't mean it and... You know, you you got to, you know, I'll be fine. And you just, you know, get your head sorted out now. And then I think, obviously, on advice uh, from uh, a reporter that was um, running the football section at uh, the Daily Mirror, who was a, a huge Tottenham fan, um, then, you know, within a month, he was accusing me of never going to see him. And I meant it. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just unfortunate. I think, you know, at the end of the day, he had to... Obviously, he went down the route of financially looking after himself, and okay, fair enough, you know. But you know, I can say the same thing happened to me, but I didn't choose to to go that route. Um, but there you go. Jim Smith was your manager at QPR. He was your manager at Pompey, also. Um, did you get on with Jim? Uh, I, yeah, yes and no. Um, you know, I think I was. I I, I didn't. You know, it was often said, you know, you don't help yourself. You know, you were asked to play in, in positions that you didn't feel it was best suited to myself personally or the team. Um, but because either 
you were short in that position or you you could play better than someone else who could play in the position you had to go there and at times so I, I refused to do that um, and I don't think it worked for me um, but you know would I do it differently if I had the choice no I wouldn't I, you know I felt I was being honest to myself honest to the my teammates and um, and uh, you know when you when you refuse a manager um, certainly like Smithy uh, you know it's it's not taken well no, he wasn't one that you thought when he was coming from QPR oh my god he's following me yeah no, but you know I've you know, had so much respect for him you know he gave me my, my opportunity in my debut and things like that and you know we you know, we we had a, a respect for each other, but we just didn't always see eye to eye. You missed out on the probably Pompey's biggest games um, against Liverpool in the semi-finals. How heartbreaking was that? Uh, yeah, as heartbreaking as you can imagine. No more than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you, you can't explain. You you, you know you. You know, we, we watched it, um, you know, from those seats at Highbury and the first leg. And, yeah, you, you know, you I trained the, the day before the morning after because I hadn't been involved because of a fallout with Smithy. And, um, you know, it was typically everything I did, you know, I, I just couldn't do anything wrong. So, you know, I was really, really up to play, looking forward to playing, and I just didn't get the nod on the day. Um you know, it's most probably uh, the biggest regret, definitely. Because you went with Kit Simmons and Andy Orford that year in a big way. So th there was a little chance for you that whole season, really. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it went well. It, it went well. They had a group of players that, like I say, I think a few of the um, individual players uh, or individual mentality um was taken away and and they, it worked well as a team. So you couldn't you couldn't argue, you couldn't say oh, oh you know it wasn't a case of do I think I'm a better player than them. Um, it was a case of it was working. So you know you just got to hold your hands up and you know, you know that was it. How do you motivate yourself when you know you're not in the manager's plans? How how do you get up in the day and and carry about carry on about your business? Um. Well, I think you, I just think you, you know, you get to a stage where you think, well, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen here, um, and you, you are looking beyond, you know, where you're at. To be honest, and thinking, well, you know, if you're if you're not going to be wanted, it sounds a bit of a stupid word, but you know, I'm, you know, you hope that someone else is going to see your ability, and and you know, and that's that's all you can do. You just come in. It's you know, you're training with the kids, really. It's, it's difficult, very difficult. I was quite surprised, because I didn't remember it, that your career was over by the age of 26, which is a time when most players would consider being in their prime. How hard was that? Yeah, I, I, at the time, I didn't really realise how. I, don't think, I certainly don't think I dealt with it. I, um, and I think it hit me later on. Uh, I went away travelling for a couple of years. Um, so I think if, and I think that was a positive thing for me. I think if I just stayed in, in this country, I think it would have been, you know, in my face all the time. Um, going abroad and, and attempting to forge a life somewhere else was, was a good thing. It didn't work out. Um, but by the time I'd come back, I thought I'd, I'd dealt with it. Um, but it was only later on you know, really that, you you know, you start thinking about the resentment of, well, you know, why did that happen to me? Um, you know, and it's, it's yeah, that's that's definitely, you, you don't realise at the time. If you doubted yourself in any way, though, you were selected for Wales whilst you were at Pompey. And I remember sitting up in the Havant News office one Monday morning when Mike Neeson was on his day off and he rushed up and he was trying to get hold of you to talk to you about that. And I was sitting there overawed by it all. But that must have been a big up for you to be selected by Wales. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's, you know, very proud. Any any player that um, is selected to play for all, you know, 
the country is it's it is incredible. No matter what country it is, then I'm not, I'm not saying that you know it could be someone playing for a very small African nation. Uh, it's um, you know, and some people go, oh, it's only it's not like you know. Uh, can't think of uh, not England. Say not. I wouldn't say England. I wouldn't say England. <laughs> Uh, no, you just you know you, everyone will dismiss it, and it's like, well, no, you can't, you can't really. It's it's a it's a big achievement, and you know you, it's, and if you if you've had feelings towards that country, you know it's it's a massive feeling. You know, for your family, for your, it was my mother who's Welsh, um, huge huge uh, pride. So then comes this day. There's this big black hole. Football is over. How? How do you then cope with that? It's all you, you've known it all your life, and then suddenly it's not there. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a very sobering thing, you know. It's not, it's not just you know the data; just you, you're literally and everything goes. You know, your your life, you're you're in this little cocoon, this little surreal world where, um, you know, you you have a level of, or you're given the impression you've got a level of importance and all of a sudden, you know, you're not important anymore. You know, you're not, um, you're just you're a normal person. Um, you know, and when you haven't been, your lifestyle has, has not allowed you to be that normal person. It's strange. It's really strange. It's a huge loss. It's, it's like a death. It's weird. It's weird. Does that perhaps lead to depression in later life? I think it can do, definitely. Yeah, I think in your you, case, well, I, think, uh, I just think it's you, you know, you know, I really started struggling, you know, about six, seven years ago. You know, I which would have taken me what was that? It would take me to about forty-five. So I wouldn't have been playing. So. No. You know, you, it, you can't really say that. It's just I think you you get a little bit, as you get older, I suppose you've got a little bit more time to, you know, look at your life and, and you think, well, maybe I wouldn't be where I am if I'd had another, what was it, 26, another eight years, nine years, 10 years maybe. Um, yeah, you do get a little bit poor me, I suppose. Yeah. You've been clapped as an NH work, NHS worker, sorry, NHS worker. You've been clapped as a footballer. What's given you the most pleasure out of the two? Or perhaps both? I was going to say, it's the fact that I haven't answered and said NHS worker shows how much football meant to me and how much joy... Uh, that you give to a fo football fan that's prepared to clap you, but then likewise, it's 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 the same to be appreciated. I think maybe maybe the fact that the NHS thing, um, you know, we you know you're not gonna you, you, when you play football, you're you, you're clapping your ability. You're not you know when you're with the NHS, you're not you're not clapping your ability. It's because that you know at any given moment you could. Uh, fall foul to this awful disease at the moment and I suppose that's you know you don't have to do it you do it by choice um, yeah there are easier jobs to do at the moment I'm sure does it put football into perspective I think it puts life into perspective I think you know part of our role is um, taking down the, the people that have succumbed to it down to uh, the mortuary and looking after them. And, um, you know, when you've, you look at the, the, the name and it's someone who you had a conversation with 10 days before and, and had a laugh and a joke and put a smile on their face and really got a genuine connection with them. And then you might see them, you know, two or three times in the ward when you're going back to taking other patients for procedures and then you're now taking them down and you know because they've passed away it's yeah it, it, it hits you it does hit you and you and you don't because we were doing you know lots and lots and lots at one stage uh thankfully we're not at the moment and mm. um you know it doesn't get easier it doesn't get easier
no, you don't get used to it at all. No, no. And we we could never see this coming a year ago, could we? No, not at all. Not at all. It's, you know, you, you've got nothing to base it on. You've got, you know, it's just, we're just so in the dark about everything. I mean, the amount we've learned, you know, over in this short period of time, you know, the fact that we can get a vaccine. You know, people were, you know, you, it can't be a good vaccine. You've know, got it too quick. We've only got it this quick because we've had multinational companies that have come together with information, mm. you know, and, and that, and, you know, all the, normally when, you know, in the East, they're working from this time, the time difference. So when they, they're working, we're not working, but they've all just come together and work together. And, it, you know, it, that's the reason why money is no object. You know, the funding has been given. And if, 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 the, if you don't get it going, the funding gets taken away and then you've got to reapply for the funding. There's been no issues about funding. They've thrown money at it. And that is why we've been able to get it. All the red tape has been cut. And, you know, that's the reason we've managed to get it quick. And, you know, we've had so many people that amazingly volunteer to be, you know, guinea pigs for it. And it's, it's just been incredible. Um, so what we've learned in such a short time and just shows that if you, if you, if you have to pull together, because it's a worldwide thing, it's just amazing what you can achieve. As a final one, having been what you've been through, what would you say to anybody suffering with mental health issues now? Because uh, there is a brighter horizon, isn't there? Yeah, there, there is. Yeah, it's, um, you know, you know, part of the reason for me being open about it is, you know, I gave I, my my image was that I, you know, I was I actually come across as I was indestructible. I was this, I was that. You know, if somebody like myself can own up to struggling, um, you know, and part of the reason why I think it's the communication. Part of the reason was it, it helped me to speak to others. I spoke to so many people who were in a similar boat who spoke to me privately. But I was helping myself by helping them. It was making me feel worthwhile. So mm. I think that's what you get from it. When, when you open up to someone, you know, not only will you get help, but you will help that person you're opening up, you know, opening up to, um, you know, somebody else who's it's been through it. Because you can go to all the counsellors in the world, but if you, they're talking from, or oh, a lot of them are talking from, you know, what they've learned, not what they've experienced. If you, if you can go through and speak to someone who's been through it or going through it and, you know, it's, you know, you, you tend to like, it sits with you better and you, you believe it better. But it's very, very difficult, isn't it, to, to get that impetus to, to actually do something? Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, it's, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I str still struggle. And, you know, this going through a situation, like, you know, it's hard enough without something like the pandemic or, you know, now, you know, the, you know, employment you know and I'm like my kids are of an age now you know 20 and 19 and, and you know it's it's basically their life has stopped um you know and it's a worry it's a concern their mental health is a worry and concern because of it you know they're you know thinking you know what can we do now and it's 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 massively different you know we're in such hard times um mm. you know mental health you know the nurses now you know and, and us to a degree but the nurses I mean we're going into ICU units and they're absolutely shattered. You can see that, you know, they're ashen, mm. you know, and, but they keep going. They have to keep going. And you're just thinking, you know, this, you know, P PTSD, that's, you know, there's going to be so much of it, that sort of thing. And, you know, after this, this, this is going to, you know, the after effects of this, once we've got, once we have got it under control, we're going to go on for years. It's, mm. you know, it's frightening, absolutely frightening. Well, Gavin, you can only do your bit, and you know I, I think you, you do a magnificent job, and I'm sure everybody else does. So, to so please keep doing it. Yeah, I will. <laughs> and thank you for joining us, mate. My pleasure, mate. My pleasure. Thank All you, Gavin. Play up, Cheers, <laughs>